Hello and welcome to the RadioTimes.com Doctor Who podcast. My name's Hugh. My name's Morgan. Uh, and this week we're talking about what might have been, it's a very wistful week on the RadioTimes.com Doctor Who podcast. Uh, yeah, because we're talking about, we've talked uh, a lot about different actors who played the Doctor, obviously, on these various podcasts, because that is pretty important to Doctor Who. And now we're talking about people who almost played the Doctor. Uh, mm. Actors who were in the frame, uh, who maybe got very close to getting the role, but then for one reason or another, didn't end up holding the TARDIS keys at the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, this has been a thing. Obviously, um, Doctor Who is, uh, well, the Doctor is one of the biggest roles on TV. A lot of people have played it, but a lot of people have been considered for it. If you think, you know, say there's, even if there was only a short list of 10 every time, you're talking about like a hundred more people who have been mm. afraid. Uh, so and obviously, yeah. uh, sorry. Well, I was gonna say with the long running show like Doctor Who, there's um, so many, points at which it could have taken a different turn right a different mm. tangent um and i think one of the most fascinating um examples of that is actors who were almost cast as the doctor or you know considered for the doctor because it would have potentially taken the show on a whole different route and who's to say whether the show would have been um the continued success it has been if if they had you know cast differently so it really is one of those kind of sliding doors moments for doctor who sliding tardis doors <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, exactly. I think it is really interesting because Doctor Who is such a sort of particular alchemy, you know, of mm. everything coming together. You do wonder if you change the slightest thing, whether it would be different. And, you know, maybe it would still be going, but maybe that, you know, would set up a chain reaction. It'd be weird if, like, the second Doctor was someone different, but then it was still John Pertwee, you know, like a parallel universe where everything's the same yeah. except that. Um, speaking of which, um, we should, we're going to try and run through these fairly chronologically. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the actors over the years who have since have said or have been confirmed independently that they were in the frame for the, for the Doctor. So we're avoiding people who are rumoured, things like that. We're trying to go for people who it's been either by them or someone else confirmed. Uh, and we're going to start with, I think, the second Doctor. Mm. Yeah, because there's there's many, many um, names that I say have been, have been linked to the role of the Doctor, some more credibly than others. Um, but we were going to go through some of the more, more notable uh, figures. And, and one of them, um, apparently, for the second Doctor, was Brian Blessed, um, who would go on to play Perry's suitor, King Yakarnos, in the Trial of a Time Lord in 1986. And he suggested more than once that he was approached to take over from William Hartnell. Um, and th I think the thing you need to remember with that is, at the time, he wasn't, he wasn't Brian Blessed in the way, you, you know, Brian Blessed! Sure, he wasn't the, the, sort of the screen icon that we, you know we now think of the screen icon he's now become. He was just a, a series regular on uh, on Z Cars, the BBC's police drama <laughs> at the time. So like fairly, you know, it's fairly credible that he may well have been in the frame. Um, uh, and I actually spoke to him um, fairly recently about about this, um, and he was saying that uh, Andrew Osborne, who was a BBC producer at the time. Uh, took me for a long walk and he said, Bill Hartnell's very old and we want a young Doctor Who, which again does align with what we know happened. Um, Blessed said he had a long meeting with, with the BBC as he weighed up whether to accept the part of the Doctor or to take on a different role he'd been offered, which was um, Porthos in a new BBC adaptation of The Three Musketeers. Mm. And apparently he said, I love Doctor Who, I love watching it, but I don't see him the way you see him. Now, his ideas... Uh, for how he wanted to portray the role, allegedly involved uh, donning makeup to make the Doctor Chinese, uh, <laughs> which were quickly, thankfully, shot down by BBC producers. Um, again, Blessed said they nearly had a heart attack. It absolutely scared them to effing death. Um, so I went off and did the Three Musketeers, which I, I, it sounds like a lucky escape to me that I, like, I talking talking about sliding TARDIS doors moments. I think that would definitely. I, I don't think classic Doctor Who would be held in the same regard um, as it is now if they had if they had gone that route. I think definitely the the Patrick Troughton um, second Doctor was was the right way to go there. I mean, it makes you think. I don't think we'd be doing a Doctor Who podcast except for hey, remember all these incredibly racist shows that were cancelled in nineteen sixty three or nineteen sixty six, yeah. rather. You know, <laughs> like I, I, yeah. I love the idea. I mean, they've had a, like you said, it was a bit of a narrow escape. I mean, clearly it was never that close to happening in terms of even then the BBC were like no dice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, we, let's not pretend that Doctor Who goes entirely untouched by you. Know, no, of um, course by by old-fashioned attitudes and approaches you know there, unfortunately there are examples of of white actors um wearing makeup to um you know to, to play a different race which um now is kind of you know frowned upon of course 
Um, but if it if it were to be the lead character, uh, lead character of the Doctor doing that, it would have such a um, you know such a more profound impact on the show. Like you said, I think it really would have um, taken it down a very different path. Allegedly, um, Peter Cushing um, also turned down the role of of the Second Doctor, which would have been a real mind bender. Mm. You know, having the, the big screens Doctor Who um, then becoming TV's The Doctor would have been really interesting. That would have been great though, because then you could have really worked the movies into the um, to the canon somehow. <clears throat> yeah, I mean that would have been really cool. I, I kind of like that idea. Like, I guess it's a little like you know Peter Capaldi having been in Doctor Who and then being in Doctor Who, and same with Colin mm. Baker. You know, like I do kind of like when they kind of bring them back, and then sometimes they make up a weird sci-fi reason. I'm sure they could have made up a weird sci-fi reason how you if know they, the Doctor gets a chameleon then... arch. You know, it's all fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, like if they didn't, then the fans would have done as to, uh, you know, they, the fans would have explained why uh, Peter Cushing was playing two different versions of sort of the same, the same character. I think it would have been interesting to see Peter Cushing do it on TV just as well to see if he took a different approach. Mm, that's a good um, point, yeah. Yeah, you know, if, if it would have been because his, his Doctor Who in those movies that we talked about quite on a recent podcast was very much um, you know, framed within it being sort of very family friendly adventure. There wasn't much room for the sort of the darker sides of the Doctor's personality. So it would have been interesting. And we, of course, we know Peter Cushing could do that stuff um, because he had a great sort of um, backlog of, of, of um, performances in, in horror movies. So it would have been interesting to see yeah, had he played a different type of Doctor. Um, a little bit of Grand Moff Tarkin to his <laughs> to his Doctor, perhaps. Yeah, that would have been really cool. Um, who's next on the list? Who's the next so, almost ran? So uh, again, someone with a previous connection to Doctor Who, and in fact, to uh, a connection to those those Peter Cushing Dalek movies. Uh, Bernard Cribbins. Um, mm. He played Tom Campbell in Daleks Invasion of Twenty One Fifty A.D. opposite Cushing, and later, of course, played uh, Wilf Mott opposite David Tennant, and he apparently was up for the role of the Fourth Doctor. Wow. I mean, when you think of how iconic Tom Baker is, that's one of those things where you're like, would Doctor Who be in the same state now? Like, I don't mean that in a bad way, like Wilfred Cribb, uh, but I called him Wilfred Cribbins, Bernard Cribbins. Uh, that's, that's how good an actor he is. They meld together. <laughs> he disappears into the role. Or at least half into it while keeping his surname. Uh, yeah, he is, he is a great actor. I think he would have done a great job. But you think something about Tom Baker in that part really made the mm. show sing and, you know, made it internationally recognisable. And you're kind of like, if through no fault of the actor's own. If someone else was the fourth Doctor, would it have done that? You know, maybe it would have mm. carried on, but still being kind of this, very much a kind of British show, rather than the kind of international thing that it is now. Yeah, and what, what's interesting about the, the Bernard Cribbins near miss here is that he, he, Tom Baker's casting actually went against what the producers at the time had planned for the fourth Doctor, because they had, they had planned for the fourth Doctor to be, to go back to, because John Pertwee's Doctor was very much a man of action. And so to go against that, they wanted to have a slightly older Doctor, more in the sort of William Hartnell vein. And they planned to cast, because um, you already had Sarah, uh, Elizabeth Sladen as, as Sarah Jane Smith, and they wanted to bring in a young male companion who'd be the one kind of, you know, doing the action stuff while the Doctor was a more sort of intellectual older figure, um, which is why they brought in Ian Martyr as Harry Sullivan yeah. as the companion. Um, and then, and so, so when, when Cribbins um, went up for it at the time, um, they were saying, you know, what can you do? Have you got any special talents? And he was saying, well, I was a paratrooper, so I can, you know, I can fight, I can do the action scenes. And they said, no, 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 that's, that's definitely not what we want. And then as he points out, you know, Tom Baker was actually, you know, they went for him in the end. He was younger than they would had originally sort of envisioned uh, the fourth Doctor. He was a lot more kind of, you know, um, fists flying. <laughs> and so actually um, they, they ended up then writing out the character of Harry Sullivan pretty quickly because he, he was kind of redundant. He, you know, he worked alongside um, their vision of of the, you know, the fourth Doctor as they had originally seen it, but didn't really work with Tom Baker's younger, more energetic take on the character. So actually, you know, what Bernard Cribbins was planning on doing wouldn't have maybe been a million miles away from what we eventually got with Tom Baker. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting. Like, I mean, you, it must be gutting to be turned down for an incredibly specific reason and then see someone get the job despite yeah. that, like, and, and then actually <laughs> lean into it. Like, that must be so yeah. strange, especially as an actor. But, but again, that is, that is where if you um, pull a thread all of Doctor Who comes tumbling down because, yeah, okay, he'd already played Tom Campbell in the in the Peter Cushing Dalek movies, but if uh, if Bernard Cribbins had played the Fourth Doctor, he almost certainly wouldn't have played Wilfred Mott later that's on. That's true. Which is, of course, such an incredible performance and such a beloved character. So like, that's you know all kinds of 
you know, different avenues open up there and take Doctor Who to, on a totally different route. It's like a metatextual turn left. <laughs> it's very much like that. I mean, because you think about it, because Bernard Cribbins was only cast in a cameo role, really, because he was Bernard Cribbins. And then they yeah. retroactively made him Catherine Tate's granddad to fill a role when um, another actor suddenly passed away. So you're kind of like, what, what, what would have happened there? They probably would have maybe recast that part instead. Do you know what I mean? Like he maybe wouldn't have been there in the first place. Yeah. They maybe wouldn't have had that part in that Christmas special. Like would, Wilfred he, wouldn't he, even exist. No, his whole association with Doctor Who is fascinating, really, when you think about it, where he played one character in these Dalek movies, then he was almost the fourth Doctor, mm. then he appeared in Voyage of the Damned in a, in a cameo, just, mm. you know, just a one-off little fun little role, and then because of a sad turn of events, then ended up becoming almost like a series regular on Doctor Who yeah. um, as, as Wilf. So, yeah, it's so many of these kind of sliding doors moments um, for, for Bernard Cribbins. Who's next on the list? Who, who, who's next... our next almost Doctor? So the next almost Doctor is, so we're, we're now looking at um, the transition from Tom Baker into uh, the fifth Doctor, who was eventually, of course, Peter Davison, but apparently Richard Griffiths, who's known for mm. uh, History Boys, With Nail and I, um, you know, many, more, many more roles. He was apparently up to replace Tom Baker and was, again, apparently being eyed to replace uh, Sylvester McCoy. There's a lot of um, talk that, uh, you know, Sylvester McCoy had planned to maybe leave after doing one more year of Doctor Who had it continued past 1989. And again, Griffiths was someone that was maybe being eyed by producers. But prior to that, yeah, had been considered for the fifth Doctor. So again, that's someone who, interestingly, was up, up for it, at least, you know, considered um, by producers not once but twice and just never got the role. And it's interesting because you do feel like, obviously with the fifth Doctor, this went in a different direction. You do feel like if the show hadn't been cancelled, maybe he would have got that role and then someone else mm. would have would have followed him, you know. I mean, it might have been that he wouldn't have anyway, but, you know, I think it's possibly likely. I mean, we talked about whether it was good for the show to be cancelled or not when it was. Um, and I think we kind of, you know, arguably we said like there was definitely some positives um, in a previous podcast. And you do sort of feel like he maybe he would have been amazing and would have turned it around or maybe, you know, he would not be well remembered because he would have ended up being the last Doctor. <laughs> mm. Do you know what I mean? It's really weird to think yeah. how it could have all gone. It's really interesting. Yeah. So next up, uh, some potential seventh Doctors, which of Remember. course, ultimately, the role played by Sylvester McCoy. Um, apparently, Andrew Sachs really? of, uh, of <laughs> 40 Towers fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He I was, didn't know that one. He's up for it. Um, but also an interesting one, uh, Dermot Crowley, who is now best known for playing Schenk, uh, Luther's boss on, on Luther. He was, he was up for it as well, which... When you consider the degree to which um, the casting of Sylvester McCoy really shaped the Seventh Doctor, mm. uh, is interesting. You know, like a lot of Sylvester McCoy's own sort of energy and you know his um, his performance is is, is uh, shaped you know by his own quirks and you know, things like playing the spoons and all all, all of that. Um, it, it feels so Seventh Doctor that that role feels so kind of tied to Sylvester McCoy. It's difficult to imagine exactly exactly how that would have worked and you know the relationship between the seventh doctor and ace later on works so perfectly with the two actors they have in Sylvester McCoy and, and Sophie Aldred it's almost one of the hardest ones to imagine someone else stepping into I'd say though I feel like all the doctor actors kind of mold it to a certain perception mm. of of what they are like if you think of you know like William Hartnell was kind of playing a kind of a slightly different character to something he'd done before but definitely playing on his own like personality and Patrick Troughton more so and then like Tom Baker is very much it like we said he completely changed their vision for the fourth doctor mm. and then when you get to the modern series like you feel like Jodie Whittaker's more like herself as the doctor than she was in other shows like Broadchurch and David Tennant yeah is very much he's not himself but he's kind of it's a very him character compared to other ones he plays I feel like I feel like there's I, you know, definitely everyone brings an element of themselves to their to their doctor, every actor that plays it. But I do feel like there's certain doctors that are more of a performance in terms mm. of like, it's it's further away from their own personality. So I'd say Patrick Troughton, that's very definitely like a character he's playing. Yeah, I don't oh. think that's that kind of cosmic hobo. I don't think is Patrick Troughton. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a few examples of that. Whereas um, I, I think there's some that are, more like more like an exaggerated more eccentric more alien version of the character's own personality and tom baker is maybe the ultimate example of that where he is um quite eccentric and, and alien uh anyway so it's kind of this perfect mold but i think you're right in that like I it feels like um jody's doctor is very much you know you see a lot of that kind of you know enthusiasm and that the fun energy in jody herself um 
I think Paul McGann, that's that's clear. the eighth doctor is clearly a, you know, it's more similar to the second doctor. That's yeah, more that's like a, a performance. That's, that's a true, actually. You definitely see the difference there. It just when you were saying it, I was thinking about it, I was like, God, you know, there are I was just thinking there's so many Doctor Who actors who are like more like how what I would perceive their personalities to be mm. than with almost any other role. Because it is such an unusual role where you're kind of like a mascot as well as a character. You're sort of like a yeah. mascot and a brand and like as well as your performance. There needs and, I think there needs to be a bit of you in it. Yeah, well, and also, you know, each actor who plays the Doctor is asked to reinvent it, right? Mm. And so, you know, and to do something totally different, not just to their predecessor, but to, ideally, everyone who's played the role before. So with each recast, that becomes harder and harder to do. And, you know, so if you're trying to go, okay, what character traits can I bring to this? What, you know, that's, you know, that, that's really tricky. Whereas if you just go, well, there's no one else quite like me, so I'll do it like me. That's kind of the easiest way to find a new Doctor. Definitely. I was thinking when you said it's getting um, harder and harder each time, you know, to, because there's so many before you, I was thinking, and yet immediately on the second go, Brian Blessed was already up for the uh, changing his ethnicity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't, yeah. You don't need to change it that much, Brian, please. Please. No. Um, um, so yeah, it is interesting. Like you say with the seventh doctor, that is definitely one of the ones where you think you can't even picture that you can't picture. And then that sort of shapes the whole series as well, because of the mm. way that that doctor was. And again, I mean, you know, going back to was it right for it to be cancelled, blah, 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 you know, would things have gone down the exact same way? We just don't know. It's really interesting. Mm. Yeah. And then, of course, when the series uh, came back for the 1996 TV movie, this is something, you know, it's, it, you get into sort of um, modern television production and, we, we, you know, it's um, a lot easier to kind of um, source the names of people who auditioned and so on. There's a lot of documentation around the TV mm. movie. And there's a long list of really interesting uh, names who went up apparently either either went up and auditioned for the role of the eighth doctor before paul mcgann got it or at least on a long list at, at a certain point um so you had uh rowan atkinson was apparently considered who of course would later play the doctor in um curse of fatal death um liam cunningham sir davos from game of thrones so i've i've heard that he was the kind of the bbc's preferred actor really was kind of he was the one that they kind of put forward and then um it was the americans who were like no 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 we need someone a bit sort of more of a kind of romantic figure um, I mean obviously Liam Cunningham did end up being in Doctor Who uh, many years later in yeah, Cold, um, War. Cold War so you know he got he got in in the end he got in in the end I think he would have been a really interesting choice because he yeah particularly if you think of him in in Game of Thrones he does have that kind of that warmth and that charm like I think he would have actually been a really great doctor I think um, so too I think we would have discovered him I mean obviously he's, he'd been acting for a long time Game of Thrones it feels like kind of introduced him to a wide audience maybe that audience would have discovered him earlier if he'd you know yeah. been in Doctor Who and you know you never know but the difference with a lot of these actors versus um the classic series instantly is that they could still play the Doctor later on yeah which is actually kind of one thing that happened to one of the prospective uh eighth Doctors didn't it yeah so yeah um well Peter Capaldi um mm. who you know whatever happened to him fan... <laughs> I mean famously though a fan of Doctor Who from childhood um he you know sort of card carrying member of the doctor who fan club but he actually turned down the chance to audition for the role of the eighth doctor um so after after series eight had aired in, in 2014 he revealed um i knew i wouldn't get it i love the show so much that i didn't want to have anything to do with it unless it was going to be me but like definitely definitely him playing the part he said i didn't want the disappointment going through all the palaver jumping through hoops for something i would never get so it's like he wanted it so badly that he couldn't risk Sort of, you know, it was the hope that would have killed him. He couldn't risk going up for it unless he was. It was definitely going to be him. Um, and because it was, uh, you know, a co-production with Fox, it was a kind of US UK uh, collaboration. He said, "I knew they would go for somebody who was well known, which Paul was, and he was fantastic." So I said to my agent, "Thank you very much, but I don't want to go along." Which is incredible when you think a that he later played the Doctor, but b that he was. He loved it so much. He was such a fan, but he was just like, "No, if it's not definitely me, I don't want to." I don't want to even like contemplate that because it would be too heartbreaking when I don't get it. Maybe he was also being incredibly polite um, to avoid saying, I thought it looked, the, the script was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, I love the TV movie, but the script that they were auditioning with was bad because um, Paul McGann's audition, you know, it's out, it's out there and it, it, his performance is incredible, but oh, this, that script, that early draft of the script is not good. Um, Mark McGann, interestingly, auditioned really? um, Paul McGann's brother, which must have made for a, a, you know, an awkward Christmas. Yeah, it um, was a chilly meal. <laughs> yeah. uh, Robert Lindsay, um, Eric Idle, 
Um, oh. Rick Mail, apparently. Um, and Anthony Head. A uh, pre... A pre-Buffy Anthony Head, like just so again, you know, you're pulling these strings. Um, this would have been just before he landed his role of Giles in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I, again, yeah, he's someone who's been talked about many, many times um, as, as as potentially you know a candidate to play the Doctor. I think he would be a great Doctor, but if we'd had him as the Doctor, we probably wouldn't have had him as as Giles and Buffy. So well, or he would have like left randomly because he was playing a character in Jonathan Creek. Um, for the first couple of episodes, just before he got Buffy, yeah, and he left Jonathan Creek, and they recast the role. So maybe he would have done the same thing, and they would have just been like, "Nah, don't fancy it." <laughs> You'd like to think that they would have they would have tied him to a you know a series contract um, if he had starred in the TV movie. But imagine if like yeah, he played the Eighth Doctor in the TV movie, and then it got you know it got greenlit to a series, and Head was out of there, and they go, "Oh, we have to regenerate again. This is just embarrassing." <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's interesting, you were talking earlier about Liam Cunningham and how they, they wanted more of a romantic hero, which Paul McGann very much is. He's this kind of, you know, dashing, handsome hero. Um, and, and some of the actors on that list kind of would have fit the bill. Like, I think Anthony Head could have definitely done that. Um, but, you know, Eric Idle, Rowan Atkinson, I, when you Rick, said that, Rick Mail, yeah. like, fantastic, you know, potentially fantastic doctors. But, but again, going against that vision of the eighth doctor that we now have, at least, you know, how he was played by Paul McGann in the end. I guess the interesting thing with a lot of these almost doctors that we know about is that we're sort of seeing the broad strokes and the ones that we have heard of, and we don't know what stage of the process we're talking about. Are we talking about kind of blue sky, who could play a doctor, what, you know, who could play these different versions of a doctor, you know, who's on our top five, who's in our top 50, you know, like you feel like mm. it's probably, I remember with um, Game of Thrones, uh, Kit Harrington said that pretty much every actor you know, probably in his 20s, auditioned for that part. Well, I think maybe he wasn't yeah. that arrogant. I think maybe Ewan Rion said it or something, because he, he auditioned for <laughs> Jon Snow, yeah. and um, so did Alfie Allen and stuff. And I feel like maybe it was a bit of one of those things where genuinely, like, they had hundreds of people kind of yeah. sent scripts and, like, in, in to do things, because they, it was such an important thing to get. And we know, like, about 10% of the people who were, at some point, vaguely in the process. Mm. I mean, there was recently a, um, a trend on Twitter from uh, the actor Charlie Con Condu, I think you say, uh, who yeah. basically he said, what's the role that if you got it, it would have changed your life, you know, what, that you auditioned for? And he was like, I auditioned for The Office for Martin Freeman's part. And then everyone was sort of sharing different things. Lots of people who were almost in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, things like that. Mm. And you do feel like there's a lot of that must be for Doctor Who, like, especially because we know so many for the eighth Doctor. We know a few for other Doctors. You must think there must have been so many, actually. And we, there mm. are so many out there we don't know about, you know. Um, but yeah, you're right. It does make, when you said Eric Idle, I almost laughed because I was like, that's very, very different. But then maybe they were trying different things, you know, just sort of putting names out there into the world to see what, yeah. see what kind of clicked for them. But like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, nothing against Eric Idle, but the, the imagining Eric Idle snogging uh, Grace Holloway is just, <laughs> that, it's, very, it's a very different scene. A very different scene. Yeah. Um, so then you get to um, a series coming back in, in 2005. And apparently the first person that the role of the Ninth Doctor was offered to, and we kind of know this because you know, Russell T. Davis has spoken quite openly about it, was Hugh Grant. Yeah, which is crazy because obviously they did work together later on in um, a very English scandal. Uh, I want to call it a very British scandal uh, when I was interviewing Russell and he told me off because he said the, uh, the Welsh and the Scots aren't involved in it. Um, it's a very English scandal. I was trying to remember that. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because... You can see why, because he was such a big figure at the time. And he'd obviously played the Doctor in, again, in The Curse of Fatal Death. But a lot of people watching that like, taking notes, I think, because there were a few people kind of <laughs> but, turned up. But he's, he's great. Like, I know he's only in it for about 10 seconds, but he's really good in that snippet in Curse of Fatal Death. So you can, you know, apart from the fact that, yes, he's Hugh Grant, you know, enormous movie star. He's good at playing the Doctor. Like, we know that. Yeah, I mean, he, you almost could see him as an alternate version of the Eighth Doctor. Not that you'd ever want to get rid of Paul McGann, but that kind of, mm. you could, not that he's the same sort of performance, but you could see him fitting the role that that character has in the TV movie, you know, like, mm. I mean, he is literally like, that is his role in all the Richard Curtis films, is the, is the like, crazy English guy, <laughs> essentially. And you could see that but, playing off quite well. Yeah, but talking about how actors um, shape their Doctors, it's hard to imagine Hugh Grant playing that sort of haunted um mm. and and more rough and ready you know war war exhausted doctor in the way that christopher eccleston did so brilliantly like i i, I can i i think you know the part of the uh, the thought process behind casting christopher eccleston was 
I think we've talked about this before, Doctor Who had maybe become, unfortunately, a bit of a joke, yeah. um, you know, in the eyes of the public with, you know, oh yeah, rub, rubber monsters, wobbly sets, blah, blah, blah. And so you needed someone with real kind of like, um, you know, Gravitas. an actor of some, Gravitas, exactly, that's the word. And someone with real esteem to kind of take it on. And Christopher Eccleston had that in spades. You know, he's this really um, you know, well-respected actor. And Hugh Grant would have done it in a different way in the fact that, like, he's Hugh Grant. Like, he's a movie star. If he signs on to this, people would know that it's, it's you know, something to be, you know, it's, it's high-quality stuff, right? It's something that you should pay attention to. It's legitimacy from a different form. Like, with Christopher yeah. Eccleston, it's kind of like, Here's an actor who knows his craft. He's a serious actor being a serious actor against the Slovene. Uh, whereas with Hugh Grant, it would have been like, oh my God, look at this international star with the Slovene. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, I, yeah, it's interesting because you kind of wonder where in the process that is and where in the process a doctor is found. You know, because you sort of feel like, I do know f from my own investigations that um, <laughs> Dal Dalek was, which is one that people feel like kind of epitomizes the Eccleston Doctor's kind of darker side. That was written a lot later than things like, obviously Rose was written very early and Aliens of London World War Three was already at the um, read through stage while uh, mm. Rob Shearman was writing Dalek. Yeah, um, well those were part of the first block of um, Aliens of London World War Three were part of the first filming block, weren't they? Yeah, exactly. So we kind of, it, you, Chris Freckleston was kind of already playing the part. And again, I, I spoke to Rob Shearman recently for something, uh, TBC on that, uh, but he basically said that the way Chris delivered the lines wasn't how he'd even written them. Because he kind of had written the Doctor confronting the Dalek as kind of a bit angry, but kind of a bit arch and a bit like, you know, mocking. And then Chris mm. Ruxton did it with this like incredible rage and like mm. pain. And he was like, oh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> but he said, but actually it's a lot better. Um, yeah, and so yeah. it's, it's really easy for us to look back and be like, oh yeah, that was obviously the intention. You know, they wanted to do this, this, you know, darker Doctor, da, da, da. and it's like, um, some of that was there, but some of that, you have to give credit to Christopher Eccleston and also, yeah. you know, the way the scripts evolved. And, you know, it's weird with his series because as we've said before, he only did the one series. There wasn't kind of a chance to kind of the reaction to that where, you know, like his second series maybe would have leaned into that in a different way or more or mm. less. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting to think Hugh Grant torturing a Dalek. You just can't really picture it. <laughs> no, although, although I will say, kind of going back on what we were saying before, but um, maybe it's, it's slightly unfair to say, you know, Eccleston's the, the great actor and Hugh Grant is the movie star. And he's this floppy haired guy from the Richard Curtis movies because as we now know, yes, he was, you know, that's how he was best known in the 90s. But now more recently, he's found success by playing slightly darker roles, like mm. in A Very English Scandal, like in, you know, Paddington 2. But he is, but he is... <laughs> a dark role. But he is, no, but he's, you know, he's, he's the villain, you know, he's, yeah, he's having, sure. clearly having fun with it. But, but there, you know, uh, Hugh Grant, I think, is, is having a lot of fun at the moment playing off of that old image of the kind of, yeah, the, the, the fop. Um, and, and so actually, you know, Doctor Who would have been an interesting one for him because he would have had the opportunity to do the the charm and the the eccentricity, but also potentially to explore, you know, dip his toe into some of those darker waters as well. Yeah, I think that would have been really interesting. Um, but he's not the he's not the only uh, Richard Curtis aficionado to almost be the Ninth Doctor, is he? So, in case you haven't uh, guessed by now, yeah, uh, Bill Nye was um, it, it was sort of I don't know if this has ever been like officially confirmed, but I remember it, it came out that he was definitely on uh Ross T Davies list right he was one of his preferred mm. preferred choices and then of course famously there was um a, a notable newspaper of the time went with the wrong doctor <laughs> and and announced that that Bill Nye was going to be the uh the ninth doctor and then quickly I think by the you know the morning it was something like the morning edition announced Bill Nye and then the afternoon edition it, that would be a collector's edition for any Doctor Who fan now you know get that one framed <laughs> on your wall Bill yeah. Nye is the but, doctor but again, you're, you know, talking about um, the extent to which the actor shapes the Doctor and uh, how the, the, perform the performance in the earlier episodes would have then shaped what came on. Like that whole relationship with Rose would have played very differently, I think, if you'd had Bill Nye as the mm. Doctor opposite, opposite Billy Piper. Um, may not have gone as, as, you know, as traditionally romantic as it ended up going with, with, with Eccleston's Doctor. Maybe, you know, maybe it would have. I don't know, but it, it feels like they may have gone a, a different route there. And it, again, Bill Nye's traditionally, you know, he's a, he's a fantastic actor and he's played many different parts, but, um, you know, you kind of think of him as being a bit of a charming rogue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, that could kind of, kind of work. Kind of, that, that's, that's a version yeah. of the Doctor that could work. Like, no, absolutely. A... But, but the, um, you know, the, again, the darkness that Christopher Eccleston brought to it, 
um, would have maybe been been missing. But as you say, that's maybe not always inherent in the scripts. That's something that Eccleston brings to it with his performance. Yeah, and then maybe the later scripts kind of end up reflecting that a little bit. You know, like mm. it's 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 really hard to know. Like we we weren't flies on the wall, unfortunately. And we you can talk to people after the fact, but they're obviously bound to kind of color it with their knowledge of what actually happened. Um, but yeah, I and obviously Bill Nye um, did get his Doctor Who chance. He's got an uncredited cameo in Vincent and the Doctor, so he is you know wearing a bow tie. Uh, and hanging out with uh, Matt Smith. So it's nice that he kind of ended up in it eventually. And again, you know, like Hugh Grant, never say never. You know, I mean, it's unlikely, but... Still time. Still, still, still time. time. Yeah, Bill Nye could do it. Uh, Hugh Grant could do it. There's lots of options. Um, so I was going to say as well, another possible Ninth Doctor, I think. I think, and feel free to correct me on this, and anyone in the comments goes well, I think David Tennant was on the list to be the Ninth Doctor. Um, Interesting. But they didn't go for him because um, he wasn't right for that version. And then that's then he obviously came on later, um, having been in Casanova, which is another Russell T. Davis, Julie Gardner production. I vaguely feel like I read that in the writer's tale, which is obviously Russell uh, T. Davis's book about the Doctor Who process. I might be wrong, but um, you know if that's true, he's another there's another example of a Doctor making it uh, later on, but very quickly afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, like, like immediately afterwards, and I've said it before, but I think one of the best. Um, transitions in terms of how it impacted Doctor Who's success was having Christopher Eccleston for series one re-establishing the credibility of Doctor Who and then as much as it would have been great to have him stay on for longer then having David Tennant come in as um, you know the the more sort of straightforward romantic hero to then take the series to a, a new level of mainstream success I think that yeah that was so perfect and I yeah. think you know or you know arguably having um, David Tennant lead series one he maybe didn't have the the star power and uh, you know and at, le at least in the eyes of the public at the time you know he he wasn't he wasn't known as you know this um this as you say you know, you know an actor who really cared about his, his craft as, in the same way as Christopher Eccleston um whereas yeah replacing Eccleston and coming on as this as I say this more traditional romantic hero taking the show to the next level I, like it just that transition worked perfectly and to kind of meddle with it I think is uh would have been potentially dangerous yeah I mean you know with hindsight we can definitely see it worked out properly um as, as far as we know uh David Tennant was the only person uh in the frame for the Tennant mm. Doctor um there's been a few examples of that we don't know that for sure like there may have been other people on a list somewhere in a secret BBC back room but um as far as we know it's just him um however when Stephen Moffat took over obviously Matt Smith became the 11th Doctor but there were um you know some other some other candidates or at least one that we know of well, yeah, so Stephen Moffat hasn't named names, um, but he has said that he was sort of addressing um, diversity on screen in Doctor Who, um, and he said that he did offer a black actor the, the role of the Doctor when he, when he first started, so the, 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 the role of the 11th Doctor. Um, and yeah, he didn't name names, but Chiwetel Ejiofor is a name that um, was doing the rounds at the time. And so many people have made the link that he was the actor who was offered it and we believe turned it down. Yeah. Which is really interesting because obviously he's um, been in some you know, really big films like 12 Years a Slave and things like that, uh, Interstellar, and like he's, you know, pretty successful uh, in his own right now. He's a movie star. Um, so you kind of think, why would he do it? But, <laughs> but also it's, it's such a big and unique part. And obviously it would, you know, it would have been like a big step forward for in inclusivity and things like that. So you can see why, mm -hmm. like, it's a little like, like Sasha Dewan becoming the first actor of colour to play the master. Like there's a kind of other side to it. And I do think that would have been quite interesting. But again, it's another one where I'm like, I think Matt Smith did such a good job coming in as this kind of younger doctor that mm. it, it feels like it's hard to imagine how Chiwetel would have done it. Also because I think Chiwetel is quite a good, like, I say a lot of friends, uh, we're not friends. <laughs> we're, not, we're not close. Um, but he, he always kind of, it feels like he kind of vanishes into his roles quite well, mm. if you know what I mean. So it's hard to kind of imagine what his doctor would have been like in a way that it is mm. with other actors. Um, also, because he's not really done anything that I can think of that's that similar. Um, but it's it's interesting what could have been. And it could be as well that, you know, he wasn't actually the person because every time there's a new doctor coming, there's always these sort of like, high flying rumors like Tilda Swinton is going to be the first female doctor and things like that. And it's like, no, yeah. she's not. <laughs> like, she's, she's got a lot on. So it could be that it was a different actor Stephen Moffat was talking about and it wasn't Tirith or Age of Four at all. I think it seems relatively possible from where, for where he was in his career at the time that mm. it was him. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Do you, do you think he would have done a good job? Yeah, no, like he's, he's clearly like a fine actor. And I think he would have made a, it, as you say, it's hard to, I think he would have done a good job. It's hard to imagine exactly how he would have played it. Because as you say, you know, I can't really think 
there's nothing that springs to mind in terms of roles he's played in the past that's anything even equatable to the Doctor. You know, when you see David Tennant in Casanova and he's this kind of eccentric, eccentric swaggering um, hero, but, you know, he's a flawed hero, you go, well, it's basically the same performance, right? And that's, It's so similar. That's no, yeah, that's no, that's like right down to the voice. And that's no dig at David Tennant because essentially Casanova was his audition for Doctor Who. So they were, like, you imagine they probably went, like you did it in Casanova, just just do that, but with aliens. Well, that's basically um, what they said for his voice. Certainly, they said do the same yeah. voice you did in Casanova. It's like when you watch Casanova now, that he goes the well thing that he doesn't got to hear all the time. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like so similar. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, whereas Chiwetel hasn't really played a doctor-ish role, um, so it's hard to imagine how he would have done it. And again, it, like. We, we, you hear Chiwetel Ejiofor for the 11th Doctor and you sort of imagine him in the tweed with the bow tie sure. and you go, well, that, that, that sounds strange. But actually, like, of course, he would have done it totally differently and like, he would have taken a different approach to the material for the 11th hour, which then in turn would have totally shaped the 11th Doctor's era in a totally different way. And it wouldn't have been Matt's Doctor just played by someone else. It would have been a whole different thing. So, you do sometimes think it's what would have been because looking back, Matt's Doctor actually, as much as people were like, oh, wow, he's a big change. He wasn't temperamentally that different to David Tennant's in some ways. Like mm. he was a kind of young brown haired guy who had a slightly romantic, you know, relationship with at least one of his companions and who wore like yeah. a nice suit. Obviously, he kind of evolved over the course of it. And he was always a little bit weirder and more nerdy. But when you put them together in The Day of the Doctor, it is a bit like, yeah, they're quite similar. And you feel like Chiwetel would have done such a different performance. Like it would have been more of a contrast. But then, you know, would mm. that have worked for people? Because it was a real wrench for people when David Tennant left, and maybe you kind of needed somebody who was in a similar kind of vein. Yeah, I think so. David Tennant was wildly popular, and so you want someone who's sort of different, as the Doctor always has to be, but maybe not that different, because, yeah, yeah, because David Tennant was so wildly popular. And, and also, Matt's 11th Doctor very much evolved, so maybe he starts out as something slightly closer to uh, Tennant's 10th Doctor, slightly, you know, he's slightly laddier, um, mm. you know, in the early episodes, and then he becomes a lot more kind of like professorial, um, Late, later on when you know when Matt's doctor is then established and he can take it in a slightly different direction definitely yeah I think I kind of love the, how doctors kind of I think it kind of works as well because you imagine that he would have kept some of his you know former self's personality and then maybe would have matured in some way mm. yeah no it works it works within the canon we'll make it work we'll make it work we'll twist <laughs> it um we should probably also talk about who may have been uh Matt Smith's successor uh yes instead of Peter Capaldi so I know, I know this one, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this one because Go for it. this was ju uh, just the time I was starting at Radio Times, actually, this was what this all kicked off. Uh, basically, the big rumour uh, that was that Ben Daniels of uh, The Crown and House of Cards and various other things um, was going to be the 12th Doctor to the extent that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, you know, had prepared all loads of Ben Daniels is the Doctor who is Ben Daniels uh, content for the big launch. And then she went along to the uh, launched with their proper TV show where Peter Cowley came out with smoke and lights and, yeah. stuff, and Rufus Hound was there for some reason um, and Zoe Ball hosted I think and yeah basically it was not true and Ben Daniels kind of made a joke out of it like oh I'm in my dressing room a Scottish man has just whacked me around the head what's going on you know <laughs> um, but supposedly you kind of like oh Ben Daniels was just sort of playing along with the gag and mm. you know doing the BBC a favour almost but actually um, you've since told me that there was maybe a bit more to it than that. Yeah, well, no. So Ben Daniels gave gave an interview, um, you know, after um, Peter Capaldi had had been cast, and he was, you know, quite freely admitting that, yeah, you know, according to him, he was on a shortlist at least. Yeah, that his um, his understanding from his agent was that he was it was definitely on the on the cards that he could have been the twelfth Doctor, and. I don't think it's, you know, it's entirely out of the realm of possibility because very much the, um, you know, the, the understanding is that Peter Capaldi was um, Stephen Moffat's only choice for the 12th Doctor. He's certainly his top choice. He really wanted Peter Capaldi. And, I, you know, I don't doubt that that's true. But there's, I find it difficult to believe that there weren't a few other names on a list somewhere, like you say, in a, in a secret case cabinet. case said somewhere. no. Yeah, right. You're not you're not going to put all your all your eggs in one basket and go, okay, it's definitely this guy Capaldi, and then he turns you down, and, and you go, well, who's Plan B? And you go, we don't have one. Like, <laughs> I just don't with a, with a show as, as big and as important to the BBC as Doctor Who. Like, even if Stephen Moffat was like, for me, it's Capaldi or no one. I don't believe he wouldn't have been sort of pinned down and go, yeah, but who who do we ask if he says no or if he can't do it because of you know a filming clash or yeah, there must have been some other possibilities, and it seems like. Um, ben Daniels was one of those. Yeah, and I think he said in an interview that 
um, he very much got the sense that there was another guy who was head and shoulders the favourite over anyone else. Yeah. So there's probably still there's still a lot of truth in the idea that yes, Peter Capaldi is the guy, but you know, could draw me up a short list of other potential people who could kind of you know follow, follow in Matt's footsteps, kind of thing. Yeah, and 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 Ben Daniels, I think, very much fits the mould. You know, talking about actors who would have done it totally differently. But actually, if you think of that that character of the Twelfth Doctor, Ben Daniels kind of it fits the, the Capaldi mould. You know, they're sort of you know, broadly the same age. You could imagine him sort of playing a, a darker Doctor. He would have been um, quite a significant contrast to to Matt Smith. So actually, if if, if Peter Capaldi is your top choice, and then you go. But if we can't get him, who else might fit what we want to do with this next version of the character? Ben Daniels probably would be on that list. You know, he's a great actor and you can see him ticking some of the same boxes that Capaldi did. Yeah, you could see him being the slightly sort of crotchetier, if that's a word. Mm. Um, slightly more crotchety version, yeah, which they kind of did for Peter Capaldi's first season. And then again, the character kind of evolved um, mm. in a similar way to Matt Smith's Doctor, which, you know, is kind of really cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think what it would have been like. It's, it's because it, it, this sounds a bit pathetic, but as, as Doctor Who fans, you get really interested in an actor and you kind of find out everything there is to know about them when they play the Doctor mm. and you have this real focus on them even after they've, they've finished the show. And then you think of that, actors you don't have that, like Ben Daniels, where I don't have that kind of laser focus on him. And I'm like, would I have known loads about Ben Daniels? <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. Like Matt Smith was cast and I immediately went and watched Moses Jones, which is oh, a show wow. that no one remembers, but I, I, remember I wanted that. to get, yeah, I wanted to get some, he was in, he was in that and he was great, um, playing PC Dan 20 man. I think that was his character's name. Very strange show, but um, I wanted to get like, yeah, a sense of Matt and you're right. And that like now I'll probably watch something because David Tennant is in it because he was in Doctor Who and Definitely. I have this affection for him. And it's the same for a lot of the actors who played the Doctor. Um, so yeah, again, that kind of, would have been interesting to see how all these various actors who could have played the Doctor would have embraced um, fandom in, in the mm. ways that all the, doctor, the actors who have played the Doctor very much have done. Definitely. Like, they would have become these ambassadors for the show. Like, it kind of... Mm. I think every actor who's played the Doctor says how much it's sort of changed or defined them in one way or another. I don't think there's anybody who... You know, Christopher Eccleston sort of stepped away from it for a while, but he never quite gave up on the fans, and now he's obviously coming back to it with big finish things. Um, so it's interesting to think all these people who you know, are out there in the universe who may have almost been the Doctor and massively had their lives changed. It's crazy. Um, we would now talk about the possible uh, people who could have been the first female Doctor apart from Jodie Whittaker. We don't know, unfortunately. Uh, that's something that hasn't really come out. There have been rumours about the likes of Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Olivia Coleman, people like that, but they're unsubstantiated. Just, he just really wanted to cast someone from Broadchurch. He was it's like, his thing. Look. It's his thing. He just yeah. he just casts from Broadchurch. Nowhere else, famously. He actually got confused and tried to cast David Tennant again. Because uh, he was like, "Oh wait, you were in it before, right?" Yeah. So I was like, "No, I, I've done it. I've done, done it." No, no, no. Um, just do, do your do your other accent and keep the beard. It's fine. <laughs> no one will know. No one will notice. Um, and yeah, so I I would be really interested to know if there if there was anyone else in the frame, or you know, because obviously Chris and Jody worked together so closely on Broadchurch, you kind of feel like maybe that was part of his idea was, "Oh, mm. you know, who'd be good? This person who was like my female lead or co-female yeah. lead, anyway." And I think he said that, you know, what he knew from working with Jodie on Broadchurch was that, A, she's a great actress, but also that the character she played in that is not her. She's not this kind of, like, downtrodden, you know, she had, you know, actually had good reason to be miserable in Broadchurch. <laughs> yeah, but, to be fair. <laughs> but in real life, she's this very kind of vivacious, energetic character. And it was kind of, again, it was the real Jodie that he was like, I want to bring a bit of that um, to the Doctor. But again, even if she was his first choice there must have been some backups, you know, or, or some other people that were considered alongside. So it, it feels like it's too recent um, as history goes um, to, 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 for those names to come out yet. But I'm Definitely. sure they will in, in the fullness of time. And it'll be really interesting, again, to see who might have been the Doctor. Yeah, I mean, we didn't really properly find out the Hugh Grant thing confirmed until a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's probably about 10 years on. So, <laughs> we'll, you know, keep, keep, keep an eye on the time. Uh, we'll check yeah. back here in a in decade. In 10 years, Hugh and I will be discussing who might have been the 13th Doctor. <laughs> yeah, and what we talk about, you know, Ben Daniels, the 15th Doctor, whatever. <laughs> finally made it, he finally made it. Come on, um, Ben. Yeah, we'll ruin for you, Ben. You can do it. You're, you're on our shortlist any day. Um, <laughs> but, you know, who do you think should have been, uh, you know, an alternate doctor. Uh, we're talking to the listeners. You know, would 
you have liked to see Ben Daniels as the 12th Doctor, would you have liked to see Chiwetel Ejiofor as the 11th Doctor? Or any of the other names we've mentioned on our list? Would you have liked to have seen Eric Idle as the 8th Doctor? Someone I mean, out there has got to be like, yeah, come on, would have been great. Yeah, um, let us know uh, in the comments. Um, this has been a bit of a bumper episode, so we hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and it's also our last episode before we have a bit of a bit of exciting relaunch news. Um, hopefully, um, I'll say hopefully in case something goes wrong technically, uh, this podcast is still going to be here um, on the Radio Times uh, YouTube channel, but we're also moving to um, some other podcast platforms uh, via like Acast, hopefully on Spotify and Apple Podcasts uh, and a few other places as well, which I forget, but we'll have more details later. Um, any, any way you can get podcasts, you'll be able to get the radiotimes.com Doctor Who podcast. Essentially, yeah, because we, we, we've been listening to you in the comments. Loads of people have been asking, can I get this on a podcast format so I can listen to it on the train or whatever? And yeah, we definitely want to do that. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you'll be hearing from us on many different platforms uh, next week. Uh, until then, I've been Hugh Fullerton. I've been Morgan Jeffrey. Goodbye. <laughs>